So it's, uh, it's hard for me not to look at the news or walk in the world around me without seeing some place where organic chemistry doesn't become important. I saw this article or a reference to this article in the news um, that in China there was a, a factory spill where, um, I don't know if you can see this little laser pointer, but you can see in bold here, um, approximately 39 metric tons of a compound called aniline got dumped into a reservoir and ultimately into the, the Shuangsheng River. Um, you know, a ton sounds like a lot to me. A 39 tons sounds like an almost inconceivable amount. Let's go ahead and talk about what uh, aniline is. Um, this is the structure of aniline. We're going to talk a lot about aniline and benzene ring derivatives. It's a very simple compound, um, aniline is. And when we get to chapter 18, we're going to do a zillion reactions with aniline. And when you get to the later chapter on amines, chapter 25 in Chem 51C, you're going to do a zillion more reactions with aniline. This is the molecule that started the field of organic chemistry. About 150 years ago in Germany, people realized that they could take aniline and do a, a super secret reaction you'll see in 51C and make dyes. Prior to that, they used to have to send ships around the world to collect dyes from indigo plants in India, or plantations in India, and other parts of the world. So the idea that you could take simple chemicals that come from coal, which you burn, and make colored compounds which were extremely valuable uh, really kicked off the field of organic chemistry 150 years ago. Um, one of the things that strikes me when I look at the pictures that were published, there were multiple news articles on this, is that um, you look at the safety precautions that people are taking in order to clean up this mess. They're laying down bags of activated charcoal. That's something that absorbs organic compounds. Um, that their main precaution here is to basically wear rubber gloves <laughs> and they're wading around in this sea of polluted water. Uh, one of the big problems here is that the water froze over and so they ended up just having to shovel up all this ice that was contaminated with aniline. So really heroic work on their part. Um, I hope we never have that kind of a problem here um, in California or in the United States or really anywhere in the world. It's a real disaster. Okay. Yeah, but unfortunately, this is the kind of stuff that gives chemistry a bad name. And I, I don't like that. Okay, so let's return back to where we left off. When we left off on, uh, on Monday, I had shown you this, this very powerful reaction. It is super powerful. And, and I tried to convey with you that this is a money reaction. And, and the mechanism I showed you, when I drew the mechanism out, let me go ahead and try to contrast what I drew with what I would like you to draw. I want you to go back and correct your notes so that you and I are both writing the same book, the same mechanism as what's in the book. And it's different from the mechanism I would draw in a graduate class. That's why I messed it up. So in class, notice up here, I, I drew the arrow going up to oxygen to leave an O minus. And then I would, there's other stuff you could draw. But what I would like you to do is draw the mechanism on the bottom, where when the chloride anion attacks, that you use these electrons in this carbon oxygen bond here to make an OS double bond and simultaneously kick out the chloride. That's the mechanism the book shows. And I want us to try to stick with the book mechanism because, the, because we'll all be on the same page as long as we stick with the mechanism that's in the book. Okay, so just try to correct that. Don't, don't let the electrons here just drop onto oxygen, make an SO double bond. The main byproduct that you get here is sulfur dioxide gas. Uh, and I didn't show that. That's not really important for you. What's the important part here? You can convert alcohols into chlorides. And that is a great reaction, thionyl chloride, for doing that. OK, suppose you don't want. So just that simple little correction on the arrows to correct your notes. Just make sure we're drawing the mechanism that's in the book. And I want to just try to adjust the lighting here. There we go. All right, so what if you don't want chlorides? Suppose it's Wednesday, and uh, chlorides are so Monday. And we're already on to, to bromides here. There's a key reagent we can use called phosphorus tribromide. And so I'm going to show you a, a reagent in case you just happen to not like chlorides, you can make alkyl bromides. And the overall transformation is very similar as to that that we did with thionyl chloride. So if we want to take some sort of an alcohol and convert that to an alkyl bromide. I mean, this is vastly better than just trying to dump in HBr or some acid. Notice, first of all, that this process leads to inversion of configuration. Just like thionyl chloride will invert a stereogenic center. 
Now actually, in most cases, your alcohol is not a stereogenic center, but in case it is, you'll get inversion. And the reagent that we use here is phosphorus tribromide, PBR3. It's that simple. And what's different about thionyl chloride is there's no pyridine base in this reaction. You generate HBr as the reaction proceeds, don't worry about that. You just let the HBr build up, it'll accelerate the rate of the reaction, actually. It's autocatalytic. Um, so this is great for primary and secondary substrates that don't generate carbocations. You'll get this very clean conversion to the bromide. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about the mechanism for this reaction. Um, the mechanism that they show in the book, and again, this is not the mechanism I would show in a, in a graduate class, but this is a good mechanism for us in, in this class. <clears throat> so the mechanism they show in the book involves the hydroxy group directly displacing a bromide. And so I'll go ahead and draw it like that. So there's lone pairs on your alcohol hydroxyl group and you've got this extremely reactive phosphorus tribromide reagent. And so now what happens, the book shows drawing this and you directly pop out a bromide. And so now you've made an oxygen phosphorus bond. And you're already well on the way to making this a fantastic leaving group. And so now let me draw this oxygen with this new phosphorus bound to it. And I've got three bonds to oxygen. Right? I can't have three bonds to oxygen without having a positive charge. So let me draw that positive charge there. And that means that bromide got popped off somewhere. Let me draw that bromide floating around down here. There's my bromide anion and I'll draw one of the four uh, valence lone pairs on that bromide anion. So now I've got this good leaving group and I can simply use that lone pair to push out this new oxygen phosphorus leaving group. And that's an SN2 reaction. That's why you get inversion of configuration. So if you want to make an alkyl bromide, don't just treat alcohols OH with HBr. You'll have all kinds of messy side reactions going on. PBr3 is the best way to do that. So the bromide attacks with inversion of a configuration. It's an SN2 process, and that's the mechanism for the reaction that I'd like you to draw for that. Okay, so very cool. There's, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, incidentally, this reagent. This is very similar. If you were cooking up methamphetamines this weekend, um, this is very similar, probably, to the method you are using. As you know, you you go buy a thousand little matchbooks and you scrape off the phosphorus scratching pad, and then you mix that with iodine, and it makes a reagent PI3. It's basically the same as phosphorus tribromide. Um, oh, why? Do you want to? <laughs> you guys seem suddenly very interested. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you go to the store and buy 5,000 matchbooks, they know what you're up to. <laughs> There's no secret there. <clears throat> yeah, you don't have to show how to make phosphorus tribromide in this class. You, you just buy that if you work in a chemistry lab. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so if you want to make chlorides, use thionyl chloride and pyridine. If you want to make bromides, just PBr3, phosphorus tribromide, and you don't need to add pyridine to this. In fact, don't add pyridine, because that's not the right set of conditions that I'm showing you. Okay, so I just want to step back momentarily. It's like, why would you want to make an alkyl halide? And what are some issues that come up when you try to make them? It's like, ultimately, you, you, the reason, at least at this stage of your, uh, of your chemistry training, the reason you're being encouraged to make alkyl halides is so you can convert, convert alcohols into good leaving groups. And, and let me show you just uh, um, the kind of thing that, you, that I'll often see people do that is kind of right thinking, but very quickly goes in the wrong place. So let's suppose that we wanted to substitute this alcohol um, and, and make an ether. How do we do that? How do we substitute an alcohol and make an ether? Hope oh, I'm drawing, the, that's four carbons. So we need to do that. And maybe there's no one step way to do this. Let me show, show you how I don't want you to do this. And you'll be inclined to think that this is possible. What I don't want you to do is think, oh, what I learned in class is that I can protonate alcohols and they turn into good leaving groups. So I'll just add a strong acid like sulfuric acid. That converts alcohols into high, into oxonium ions, so I can have an H2O leaving group. 
And so if you did this, what you would have floating around is some sort of oxonium ion. And then, it, it, then maybe you could add some sort of a, and I'm going to have to abbreviate this phenyl with pH. And then maybe I could throw in some strong nucleophile to displace the, the leaving group. <clears throat> and that won't work. Let me show you why this will not work. I'll just write no here. The reason why that won't work is if you put phenoxide anion or any alkoxide anion, any strong nucleophile, it doesn't matter what the strong nucleophile is, in the presence of sulfuric acid, you're never going to protonate the alcohol. Any nucleophile that's nucleophilic enough to attack a carbon oxygen bond is very rapidly going to displace, <clears throat> is very rapidly going to deprotonate the sulfuric acid and then you don't have sulfuric acid anymore and you don't have any nucleophile. You can't simply add acid and think, oh, well, the proton will stick on my, uh, my, um, my substrate. So in other words, don't hope that you're going to get that proton to stick on the substrate like this and then just wait around for a nucleophile. Maybe you think you'll be clever and you'll add sulfuric acid first and then let it protonate and then walk over and get a bottle of nucleophile and dump that in. That won't work. If you have phenoxide anion floating around, if you add phenoxide anion to an alcohol that's been protonated, it's never going to attack carbon. It will always more rapidly deprotonate the proton. This is what's going to happen. So if you want to make an alcohol into a leaving group, don't try just dumping acid in. Use thionyl chloride and convert it to a chloride leaving group. Or if you want to convert an alcohol into a leaving group, use phosphorus tribromide and convert it into a leaving group. So the right ways to do this kind of stuff are like this. I take my alcohol, I use my money reaction, thionyl chloride, SOCl2. I always remember to put my pyridine base in there. And then I cleanly make the alkyl chloride. And now I can throw in any nucleophile I want. You get to pick whatever you want. I mean, it could be this phenoxide anion if you want. I think you guys are doing SN2 with phenoxide anions in, in lab. Not this week. Uh, I think you're doing recrystallization this week. And that makes this nice new carbon oxygen bond. So easy. And if you don't like chlorides, then you can simply add PBr3. That's your new reagent now. And then do the displacement with sodium phenoxide. Okay, so as far as you know now, this is the reason to make alkyl chlorides. Because it allows you to make leaving groups where you can throw in whatever nucleophile you want. But uh, <clears throat> that's not really why we make alkyl halides in organic chemistry. There's a secret reaction you're going to learn at the start of Chem 51C. Super top secret, but I'm going to show it to you now. And I won't ask this to you on the exam because this is Chem 51C stuff. But if you can remember this, you're going to be golden for Chem 51C. Here's the super secret reaction from Chem 51C. What we're going to show is you can take any alkyl halide, chlorides, bromides, and iodides, and you add lithium or magnesium to that, lithium metal. Just store this in the back of your mind for another quarter and this will really be valuable to you. And what will happen is the, the lithium metal will replace the chloride. And that is the most powerful nucleophile that we have in Chem 51. That's more powerful than alkoxide or amide anion. That alkyl lithium, that carbon lithium bond that I drew here, is so nucleophilic that we're going to be able to use that to attack carbonyls. This is all of Chem 51C in a nutshell. Don't tell anybody I told you. I'll be in trouble. And that's the best, you can't quite tell because I did a bad job of drawing that CO double bond. But that right there is the best way of forming carbon-carbon bonds. It is better than any other method that you, that you ever saw um, or will see throughout this quarter. So this is why we're teaching you to make alkyl chlorides. And you're going to forget about making alkyl chlorides when you get to 51C. And so let me just remind you, it's this CC bond forming process that you're going to use. So you don't need to use that now, just kind of forget that or store it in the back of your mind. But um, this is why you really need to know how to make alkyl chlorides. And we're going to bring this back to you uh, in about three months and hit you with it very hard. Okay, so how do I like to make leaving groups out of alcohols? In fact. 
I'm not a big fan of making alkyl chlorides and alkyl bromides. The book is a huge fan of that. The sapling problem sets that are pre-programmed in that I select from seem to be a huge fan of that. Here's my favorite leaving group, one that I love. <clears throat> it's called a tosylate leaving group. So if you want the, the best and easiest way to make leaving groups out of hydroxyls, here's the way to do it. You take an alcohol of your choice, and what we're going to do is we're going to replace that H with, with some special functional group that makes the carbon-oxygen bond easy to displace. And so here's our reagent. It's called tosyl chloride. And we use its abbreviation TSCL. Um, and over here you can see I've abbreviated tosyl chloride for you. Tosyl chloride is a benzene ring with a methyl group on one side. That's called toluene. And then on the other side, there's this sulfonyl with a chloride. It looks a little bit like sulfuric acid. It turns out that it's very easy for nucleophiles to attack that sulfur and displace the chloride. So when you treat an alcohol with tosyl chloride and a base, and the base we use, excuse me, is pyridine. So this is kind of like thionyl chloride in that you add pyridine. We'll have a lot of reactions that use pyridine as a base. That's why you're going to tend to forget with the phosphorus tribromide and accidentally write pyridine with phosphorus tribromide, and you have to avoid uh, doing that. And so when you do that, it now creates something called a tosylate leaving group. That OTS, that entire OTS is called a tosylate. Let me go ahead and circle that just here so you can see that this whole group, to tosyl and oxygen, is called a tosylate. And how do I label that? <laughs> I've got the word tosylate over here. There it is, I've underlined it. So that's a tosylate leaving group. It is now very easy to displace that carbon-oxygen bond. What a fantastic leaving group we have here. And so I can add the nucleophile of my choice, and I'm just for the sake of having some room, I'll draw a very small one like sodium methoxide. That'll very easily do an SN2 reaction. So let me draw some arrows here so we can see that SN2 reaction. There's my alkoxide and it will displace that whole tosylate business is a fantastic leaving group. And usually I don't draw the bond between oxygen and tosyl, I just write OTS. <clears throat> Let me just complete some charges here on this sodium plus and oxygen minus. There we go. Okay, so you can use any nucleophile you want. Gee, what a great way to make a, um, um, to make a leaving group out of oxygen. And so let's go ahead and talk about the mechanism for this so I can give you a sense for why this is a superior to thionyl chloride or phosphorus tribromide for making leaving groups out of oxygen, out of hydroxyl. So the mechanism for this reaction, here I'll, I'll take my super simple propanol substrate, involves the lone pairs on the hydroxyl group attacking um, this sulfonyl chloride leaving group. So this this sulfonyl chloride sulfur is tetrahedral. <coughs> Mechanistically, that's not important, but I just want you to have a sense for the shape of that molecule. And so you can imagine the hydroxyl group. This is the book mechanism um, that I want you to know. So you can imagine that hydroxyl group just coming in and doing a displacement that pops out chloride anion. And there we go, we've formed an oxygen-sulfur bond. And now I'm, good, I, I'm smart enough to draw this OH bond because I know I'm going to pluck that proton off in the next step. And now I have this very electron withdrawing. Um, I'm going to abbreviate that toluene, that benzene ring, as tall. That stands for, stands for tall O. Uh, but you can get what the abbreviation means just by looking over here to the left. Okay, so now we have this oxygen of three bonds that better have a positive charge that really wants to be deprotonated quickly. And what's weird to you is that, or may seem weird to you, is that, gee, there's chloride in there. How come that chloride doesn't do some SN2 reaction? Well, there's no way that's going to happen. The pyridine is going to so quickly deprotonate. Proton transfer reactions are always faster than reactions, comparable reactions um, 
that form bonds to carbon. So now that pyridine is going to come back in here and deprotonate that proton, and that's it. That's how we put the tosyl group on. This whole, this whole tosylate thing is this whole contraption that I have um, attached here is my tosyl group, tosylate group. So this whole thing is a great leaving group. Now what's the magic behind this that makes this so much better? Why is this so much better than the thionyl chloride? Because nowhere in this tosylate business did I break the carbon-oxygen bond. When you, make when you make an alkyl chloride from an alcohol using thionyl chloride, you have to do an SN2 reaction with chloride. Nowhere in this, in this, in this bottom mechanism scheme did I have to break that carbon-oxygen bond through a lousy SN2 reaction. SN2 reactions are lousy. The more SN2 reactions you have to use to synthesize something, the more chances it's going to fail or give you elimination of some kind. So the fact that I can convert this oxygen into a great leaving group without breaking the carbon-oxygen bond yet means that this is just plain superior to the thionyl chloride. <clears throat> so tosylates work better in practice. Now maybe when you're just drawing reactions on paper, it doesn't matter, but what you'll find is that um, I tend to favor making tosylate leaving groups over thionyl chloride. And that'll become important later in the chapter when I'm asking you, how do you synthesize this? I'll, I'll tend to pick roots where tosylate, forming tosylate leaving groups is, um, is the way to go. Okay, so tosylate. Let me just uh, write here because that's one of your money reactions. So remember this one. Make tosylate leaving groups. <clears throat> the tough thing is you've had an entire chapter, two chapters on chlorides and bromides. It's going to be hard for you to, to steer away from that. And I get that. Money. Okay, so um, I showed you ways to take alcohols and do chemistry with those. You can convert alcohols to chlorides. You can convert alcohols to bromides. You can convert alcohols to tosylates. So what can you do with an ether? Um, they're nowhere near as reactive, but you can break carbon-oxygen bonds with ethers. So let me take an example. And there's a strategic thinking here. Here's an example of an ether where one of the carbons is tertiary and the other is primary. And I like that distinction because those are hugely different. I hate secondary because I can never figure out whether it's elimination or substitution or what's going on with those. In the lab, I avoid secondary substrates because the, the molecules don't know what to do either. So here's, two, here's an ether. This is T-butyl methyl ether. This carbon's tertiary, this carbon's primary. So if anything is going to happen, so let's suppose I add an acid and protonate this ether. <clears throat> There's two different things that can happen. One thing is that the tertiary carbon can pop off the oxygen and form a carbocation that's stable. The other thing that can happen here is that bromide can, can uh, substitute at this very unhindered carbon and do an SN2 type reaction without forming a carbocation. And in practice, you'll see both. So uh, if you add two equivalents of HBr, you'll get this through an SN1 reaction. And I'll show you the mechanism for a minute. And you'll get this through an SN2 reaction. In other words, you can cleave both of the carbon-oxygen bonds by adding HBr. Okay, so let's draw out a mechanism for this, for how to think about this. And the main thing I want to do is give you a sense for, under typical reactions, which carbon-oxygen bond breaks first, under typical reaction conditions. So when you take HBr, excess HBr, and you put it in here, the first thing that's going to happen is that we're going to protonate that oxygen. HBr is a very powerful acid. 
of three bonds to oxygen, and I wish I had drawn a bigger bond, a, a more space there for my bond, but there's lone pairs on this oxygen, and they're going to pluck a proton off the acid because that's such a strong acid, and I'll get this oxonium ion, oxygen with three bonds. That oxygen wants to take its electrons and walk away. And so the main thing that you wouldn't know right now, there's no way you could know this, I, ha I simply have to tell you, otherwise you couldn't know, is it under typical concentrations where you would run this reaction. And this is concentration dependent. You've got a choice. Either the bromide with its lone pairs can come in and attack the methyl, or you could simply ionize out um, the oxygen. And it depends on the concentration of bromide. If I, have, if I dump in sodium bromide and have 10 times the concentration of bromide, the bromide will attack the methyl group faster. But under typical reaction conditions, that's not fast enough. Under typical reaction conditions, this bond simply cleaves before bromide can attack that methyl. And you couldn't have known that. I simply had to tell you that this is, of the two possibilities, this is the more likely to happen faster. So you gener generate a T-butyl carbocation. There's my T-butyl carbocation. And your byproduct is methanol, momentarily. And so what happens now is that the bromide anion that's floating around in there can come in and easily attack. So let me draw that bromide. Just adding into that, that pathetic looking carbocation that doesn't have an octet. <clears throat> and now the, the alcohol that's in there can be protonated by the second equivalent of HBr. So the, this equation I showed you up above, I showed two equivalents of HBr. And so now we simply reprotonate that. And now the slower reaction, this is not quite as easy. So now the water's an okay, a, a decent enough leaving group to where this bromide can now attack this very unhindered there's no hindrance with a methyl group. Whoops, I wish I were using green there, I, just to be consistent. That bromide anion can now displace to make the methyl bromide. So that's the, the mechanism for the reaction. <clears throat> that's not a very, I would say, that's not a very interesting reaction. Um, but we have to show you something you can do with ethers. We have super secret reagents that have, involve boron that involve similar mechanisms that are a little bit more efficient for, cle uh, for cleaving ethers. Uh, but we won't show you those uh, in, in the lower division classes. That's something for upper division classes. All right, so um, ethers, you can cleave them, use strong acids. You could protonate oxygen and make oxygen into a leaving group. Um, it's good with HBr and HI because bromide anion and iodide are so nucleophilic. It's not quite as good with HCl. I've never, I can't think that I've ever seen that in my personal experience. Okay, so strong acids can cleave ethers, especially if they're tertiary and can form stable carbocations. Okay, huge shift in gears now, because I want to talk about an ether that's, uh, that's a special ether, and that's an epoxide. So let me go ahead and draw out an epoxide here. And I want to admire the ring strain in that epoxide. Oh my. You know, carbon and oxygen, second row atoms, typically want, if they've got four bonds to them, typically want to have 109 degree bond angles. And that epoxide has 60 degree bond angles. 60, not 109, 60. There is a lot of strain in there. And that means that we can use nucleophiles to cleave epoxides, which are ethers, in ways that we couldn't do any other kind of ether. So I'll show you a, a typical um, sort of uh, reaction sequence here. And, and what I want you to do first is note that I'm enumerating my steps. And this is something you're going to have to learn how to do. I'm going to throw in my nucleophile, sodium, um, this sodium thiolate nucleophile, that's Na plus, SET minus, or if you just stuck them together and didn't write the plus and minus, that's okay. So there's a thiolate anion there, that's a great nucleophile. It's way more nucleophilic than it is basic. It will draw out a mechanism for this. It will, it will add in and open up that epoxide. 
And then in step two, I have to protonate the O minus that I generate. And so I have to write a step two. So I'm enumerating these, step one and step two. If I leave out the one and the two, the enumeration, that's wrong. I can't simply mix sodium methox, well, you'd get a poor reaction if you sim simply mix the sodium methoxide anion in the water. It would not be as good. And I'll walk through the mechanism just momentarily. See how I've made a sulfur carbon bond? And over here where the O minus sprung up, the point of swamping that with a ton of water, I write the word work up, it just means you shake it with a bunch of water, is that you protonate the O minus. Okay, so let me draw out that uh, mechanism for this. Okay, so again, we're going to see this a lot, this idea of working up reactions, water work up, excess water. The reason is it's just very hard to isolate anions and cations. Organic chemists always want to convert charged molecules into neutral molecules because then we can extract them into organic solvents. So the word workup means I was just trying to take O minus and convert it into a neutral OH. So you'll frequently see us add water in a way that looks like a reagent. I usually write the word workup so you know I'm simply trying to stick a proton on some anion to get a neutral molecule. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw mechanistically what's happening. First step is nothing more than a simple SN2 reaction. Um, and I say simple, it works because of the ring strain here. So here's my thiolate anion. And my thiolate anion comes in and attacks this very strained system. And it attacks on the least hindered side. Just like all the other SN2 reactions that you've seen so far. It attacks the least hindered side of this epoxide. If they were both equally hindered, you'd probably get a mixture of attack on one side plus on the other side. But I was careful to pick something where the two sides are dramatically different in terms of steric hindrance. So that strain is what makes that work. And so now we pop this open and we have this O minus floating around. And I don't have any good way to isolate that in the lab. So in the laboratory I need to protonate that so I can extract it into an organic solvent. And this is why you use water. And it's kind of like Le Chatelier's principle. If we just had one equivalent of water, you know, I'll end up with a one-to-one -one mixture of hydroxide anion and my alkoxide. You have to use a ton of water to make sure you fully transfer all the protons over to this alkoxide in order to neutralize that. And so the end, end result is I have a neutral organic molecule that I can isolate I can extract it into an organic solvent and then evaporate all the solvent off and there I go, I've got pure molecule there. So that's the point of the workup is I don't want to end up stuck with this, this sodium alkoxide trying to isolate that. Let me draw the sodium counterine here. That would be really hard to isolate in the lab. Uh, it's very easy to isolate neutral organic molecules. So there's all kinds of nucleophiles that you can use like this to do SN2 reactions on epoxides. I could have used a methoxide anion. I could have used a phenoxide anion. I could have used an azide anion. It's a nucleophile you forgot about from back from chapter uh, seven. Um, so epoxides have all this strain built into them that allows you to, to do SN2 reactions on them. Okay, so let's, um, let me just remind you of the distinction between epoxides, which are ethers, and typical ethers. Yeah, epoxides, so let's just, Let's just be clear here about what the differences are. And I'm going to try to jazz this up. I'll make one of these an ethyl group because <laughs> I'm tired of drawing the same epoxide every time. So we're going to have all kinds of reactions where we can throw in nucleophiles, um, that, that thiolate anion, alkoxide anions. There's just enough ring strain. It sounds like a lot of ring strain, 26 kcals per mole. But alkoxides are lousy leaving groups. There is just enough ring strain to allow you to do this um, SN2 reaction. Just enough. And I'll just write here. The reason why the, you can attack an ether like this is because of strain. But if you have any less ring strain, it doesn't work anymore. So in other words, if I have a four-membered ring, it doesn't work. You can't do SN2 reactions on this kind of four-membered ring with, with basic anionic nucleophiles. So it's not enough strain. So you won't get SN2 with an alkoxide anion. So I'll just write no. 
Don't try to use, um, it's not that there's not strain there, I'm just saying you don't get any SN2. And a five-membered ring, look, if a four-membered ring doesn't have enough ring strain, yeah, of course a five-membered ring doesn't have enough ring strain. No. If you try to do just a regular acyclic ether, like diethyl ether, there's not enough ring strain. It's only epoxides that have enough ring strain where you can use anionic nucleophiles like alkoxides or thiophenylate anions in order to, in order to push those open. It's just too hard with any other kind. Um, of nucleophiles. So it's, epoxides are obviously very special ethers, uh, even more special than four-membered ring ethers. Okay, let's, um, I want to strongly contrast um, these kinds of basic reaction conditions where you have alkoxide anions and thiophenylate anions. Um, those can open epoxides by attacking the least hindered side. But now, let's switch gears. Totally different universe. We're going to talk about epoxides and acidic conditions. This is going to be hard for you to keep straight. What does it matter? Epoxides and basic conditions, epoxides, acidic conditions, makes all the difference in the world. And I'll show you how the, res how the results will differ here. I'm going to take exactly the same epoxide that I showed you before. And this time, I'm going to run the reaction in the presence of sulfuric acid. And I'll write catalytic here, just so we can remember that the role of that is as a catalyst. And as you might guess, the sulfuric acid is going to protonate the epoxide. Now, I can't throw methoxide anion in with sulfuric acid. If I throw methoxide anion, it's simply the sulfuric acid will simply protonate the methoxide anion. But I can throw neutral methanol in. I can use that as a solvent. It's a cheap solvent. And so now when we look at the result, yes, the methoxy group is going to attack the substrate. But let's take a look at the regiochemistry here. In this particular case, and I'm going to use a, a colored marker here, so you can see the new bond that I formed. The methoxy group at attacks at the more substituted position. Right? In the, in the previous example that I showed you, it was totally expected. Oh, yeah, nucleophiles always attack more hindered positions. And now suddenly I'm showing you that the nucleophile is attacking, um, sorry, nucleophiles attack the less hindered positions. Now I'm showing you that the nucleophile is attacked. Um, the more hindered positions. What are some common nucleophiles for, for these reactions of epoxides under acidic conditions? Let me just make a little list of the common nucleophiles. One would be to have water act as a nucleophile, where you replace the H bond with some carbon. Another word would be just like I showed you here, to have an alcohol act as the nucleophile. And then uh, another example would be to have HBr and even HI, not so commonly with HCl, but um, but HBr and HI would be common nucleophiles. I know whether it's where the H would end up here and the bromide would end up there, or the H would end up here and then the, the OH nucleophile would end up there. Okay, let me walk through the mechanism because there's no way in the world on the planet that you could guess this. So the first step you could guess. I'm going to abbreviate my acid with the symbol HA. And the first step I think you could guess, it's simply that you protonate the epoxide. And that converts the alcohol now into a good leaving group. But when I draw this, when I draw this next intermediate, I'm purposely going to distort it so you can get an appreciation for what happens when you protonate a strained epoxide. What I'm going to do is I'm going to distort it so you can see that this bond to the tertiary center is now elongated. In a way, you can kind of think of this bond to the tertiary center as kind of pre-broken. It's almost like it doesn't pop open and make a tertiary carbocation. But it's almost as though this oxygen is walking away with its electrons already. <clears throat> so this, the bond to the tertiary center is now easier to break. And that's what you couldn't have guessed. And so now I'm going to show you something that should be totally unexpected to you. And that is that nucleophiles like water, like bromide anion, 
anything that can, can exist without being totally protonated in sulfuric acid, they don't attack with this charge on here. They don't attack at the less substituted position, they attack at the more substituted position. So if you had some kind of rule in your head that, oh no, you don't do SN2 attack at tertiary centers, yes you do. In the case of strained three-membered rings that have positive charges, you always attack at the more substituted position. So there is no rule that says you can never do SN2 at tertiary centers. This is where you do it. Three-membered rings with a positive charge on one of the atoms in the ring. And it's going to be hard to get away from this. You've now had three chapters telling you never do SN2 um, at tertiary centers. Okay, so here's the next intermediate. We've got this inconvenient proton sitting there on that nucleophile. So let's get rid of it. There's three bonds to oxygen. There has to be a positive charge on there. Um, I've still got my A minus left over from my acid floating around. That's my symbol for sulfate anion or anything that could, that's got a lone pair in solution. And that simply plucks the proton off and, and gives me my product in the end. Okay, so do you see how this is totally different from the methoxide under basic conditions? Methoxide anion attack the least hindered side. But under acidic conditions, A, I can't have methoxide. I have to have methanol. Methoxide would grab the proton off sulfuric acid. So under acidic conditions, you, you can't have anionic nucleophiles like methoxide. They'll simply protonate, so you use methanol, and that attacks at the more substituted position. And it goes with inversion of configuration. It's not obvious with this particular substrate, but you end up getting inversion of configuration at that center. Um, and that means it's stereospecific. Okay, let me uh, just give you a quick heads up for something you're going to, uh, you see, this is the last slide and I'm simply going to, uh, well actually I'll draw these for you instead of showing them. I just want you to see in one slide this summary of epoxide reactivity. So let's go ahead and start off. If I have an anionic nucleophile under basic conditions, those attack at the less substituted position. But if I choose to use acidic conditions and I rely on the protonation, of my epoxide, you typically don't have pro anionic nucleophiles um, like methoxide. You have neutral nucleophiles and those attack at the more substituted position. So under basic conditions with methoxide and things like that, you attack the less substituted position. With acid catalysts like sulfuric acid, you attack the more substituted position. So that's the important, sorry my arrow here doesn't look so, so nice. Okay, you're going to see stuff like this again later. In the next chapter, get ready, in chapter 10, I'm going to show you this kind of idea again. We're going to have species that you've never seen before called chloronium ions. Strained three-membered rings where there's a charged atom in there. And what you're going to see in chapter 10 is that nucleophiles attack those at the more hindered position. In the next chapter, I'm going to show you the same thing with bromonium ions that are three-membered rings. And nucleophiles will attack these at the more hindered position. So you can see the analogy for, with protonated epoxides, this weird thing called a chloronium ion, this freaky thing called a bromonium ion. These three-membered rings are special, and it's only three-membered rings. You attack at the more substituted position. Everything else is the same way you've learned it. Avoid steric hindrance and attack at the less substituted position. But it's this positive charge. Okay, so that's it for chapter, um, chapter 9. Um, on Friday we're going to start with chapter 10 and do, and we're going to learn a lot of reactions in chapter 10.